Hi, I'm Paul J. Welcome back to the analysis.news. Please don't forget the donate button, subscribe button on YouTube. Be back in a second. So this is a continuation of my discussion with Bill Black about what he calls control fraud, sort of the modern history of uh, financial fraud in the United States. And once again, Bill Black is an American lawyer, academic, author, and a former bank regulator, which we've been talking about, with expertise in white-collar crime, public finance, regulation, and other topics in law and economics. He's the author of the book, The Best Way to Rob a Bank is to Own One, and he's an associate professor at the University of Missouri, Kansas City in economics and law. Thanks for joining us again, Bill. Thank you. So if you haven't watched part one, you really should, because it's a compelling story of this massive banking fraud that took place during the Reagan administration. Um, and, and we're kind of continuing on that conversation. Um, and I'll kind of pick up where we left off with this question. Um, a lot of people actually did go to jail. A lot of senior banking executives went to jail as a result of your work, your, you and your team's work and, and others who were investigating and prosecuting. Um, yet, when we get to the 07, 08 uh, crash and another massive banking fraud, uh, the executives uh, do not fear in any way uh, being charged with fraud, going to jail, and they were quite right not to fear it because none of them did. Uh, so, uh, w so bring us back to these, you know, this next chapter of the SNL investigation you were involved with, uh, and which, w when people really do start going to court and going to jail and getting punished, uh, but it didn't seem to really change anything. Well, I actually changed an enormous amount uh, of stuff, um, but it nothing works forever. Um, and when they abandoned the things we did, well, then you got exactly what you talked about. Um, but they didn't have to abandon um, uh, everything that worked. So what worked? Um, we embarrassed the Department of Justice into prosecuting. And they came up with something clever that was actually good for the world. And it was called the Top 100 Project. You had to fight for which cases were really the top priorities, you know, which caused the most harm, which ones do we have evidence where we can get convictions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so it was a very serious process, led to the top 100 list. And uh, that was roughly 300 institutions, roughly 600 individuals. Virtually everybody on the top 100 list was prosecuted. And we got over a 90% conviction rate uh, against the most elite uh, defendants. So let me just we, ask one quick one quick question. Uh, this took place after Reagan had left office, and it's now Bush one. In other words, a lot of these people who were correct. Reagan's friends start getting prosecuted when Reagan's no longer president. Correct. This occurs under President uh, Bush the first, right? Um, and so. They, these people um, have the best criminal defense lawyers in the world. America still does something right. Um, and the firm will spend money like water to, to try to keep them out of prison because they control the firm uh, as well. So a lot of their work is, uh, legal work is free. And we still manage to get that success rate. And again, against the most elite folks, and in that era, the sentencing guidelines were weaker, but we still got um, over 80% of them getting criminal terms, uh, just, uh, prison terms. Uh, so we didn't just convict them, which in itself is a, back, a big deal getting that on their record, but we actually sent them to prison in the overwhelming bulk uh, of those cases. This was so successful that it completely changed the political dynamics. Our biggest disadvantage, of course, is money, uh, political contributions, and lobbying, which I've told you the extraordinary success of majority of the House of Representatives, five U.S. senators, the Speaker of the House, um, the ability to uh, prevent... Ed Gray 
was not able to get a single piece of helpful legislation during his entire term in office, right? Zero, not a, it, during this crisis. But when we did these convictions, a couple of things happened. First, it was no longer a business page story alone. It was a front page news story alone. And it was a front page news story because in part of the political counterattack on us, right? So once it became uh, a story of political corruption of the Keating Five intervening and removing our jurisdiction, Speaker Wright uh, demanding that gay regulators be, uh, senior regulators be fired and such. Well, the business press was extremely hostile to us, but general reporters, political reporters, hey, we were bringing them a great story. And the nature of narrative is they had bad guys. The bad guys were the executives uh, and their political cronies. They kind of needed a good guys in the story. <laughs> and they looked around and said, oh my God, we're going to have to use regulators. <laughs> as good guys. So for the only time, th during this period when regulators were demonized as just an absolute norm by both parties, for a very brief time, regulators became kind of the heroic uh, folks uh, uh, holding um, the, back these forces of evil that were ripping you off. And we really went after that. We didn't just make criminal referrals and get these cases, we, and I in particular, spent collectively thousands of hours explaining to the media what the fraud schemes were, who was hurt, how they use political connections. And that pays off eventually uh, if you establish credibility with them that you're telling them the truth. And then we would explain it in English and in, in vibrant English so that they could actually have good copy uh, and such. And so there were many more substantive stories explaining the nature of the ripoff. And being Texas, there were all kinds of stuff, including, you know, providing prostitutes to the top state regulator in Texas of savings and loans on a regular basis and doing so on the sister ship to the presidential yacht. This little burg, uh, Vernon, Texas, had the sister ship to the presidential yacht parked in the Potomac <laughs> as its lobbying platform, <laughs> complete with the Speaker of the House and prostitutes and such. Well, you tell those stories and the world starts to perceive uh, all of this a lot differently. And the numbers that they're ripping them off are so big, both how much, you know, money is going to the top executives, but also how much immense loss to the public uh, in all of this. How and much? Then, uh, collectively about $150 billion. But then Keating unintentionally did us a further service. Our problem, both in law and in PR, um, was that there's no much identifiable individual in, uh, victim. And we know that statistics don't move people. Narrative moves people, of people they can identify with, victims they can identify with, which, of course, every lawyer knows. You, you know, he's a prosecutor. You present the victim if they're alive. And the jurors relate uh, to that type of thing. But deposit insurance means nobody gets a check, uh, you know, bill that says you're going to have to pay $2,000 because of the screw up at Lincoln Savings. So the taxpayers don't really know um, directly what's happening. Keating decided to rip off uninsured people because of a regulatory crackdown, he couldn't rip off the um, insured people quite as much for a while. And so he targeted uninsured people to sell 
worthless junk bonds of his holding company out of the branches of the savings and loans so the people would think it was safe. And on top of that, he t decided to target this good Catholic, alleged good Catholic, retirement communities in California. And did this to over, to tens of thousands of people. Now they suffered real losses. And now we had over 30,000 identifiable victims. And so we could go and look among them as to who had the best narrative. Okay, let me just make sure we're, our viewers are following. These are people who do not have their uh, junk bonds insured by the federal government as other people with savings accounts did. So when they lost, they lost. They lost personally and there was no insurance fund to bail them out. And they lost a much bigger portion of their savings, often all of their savings, because they did a bait and switch operation. Lincoln Savings insured entity would advertise for certificates of deposit, insured, fully insured certificates of deposits, where, you know, the type of thing, it's a two-year term, so you get a slightly higher interest rate. People would call in from the retirement community and say, hey, I'm interested. And then comes the switch, now that you baited them. Oh, if you're interested in higher yield, why not look at the bonds of our holding company? They're backed entirely by the all the assets of Lincoln Savings. And they pay a higher interest rate still. And so that's how the basic game worked, right? And they discovered that 18-year-old boys, kind of men, were the ideal folks because disproportionately the people living still uh, in these um, uh, very elderly communities were women, right? Oh, 18 year old boys mean are uh, trying to sell this stuff. Not trying, succeeding, right? They had contests, bond buster t shirts, it's a reward, weekly rewards. At the end uh, was of the Keating, was Keating the only one doing this, or were some of these other uh, SNLs? Keating doing was this? the only one doing this particular one. And uh, at the end of the year, at the Christmas party, uh, they did a skit mocking the elderly victims of all of this. Now, also a number of the, they're 18 year old boys. They don't know anything about finance. There's no training. They're lied to by Keating's executives. So a number of them put their grandmothers in this as well and mothers. So it's a mixed thing, all right? But as I say, this gives us over 30,000 people we can choose not in the story. And so we led with the woman who um, was, I think, in her early 60s, who explained to the nice young 18-year-old um, that she was trying to save um, for a wheelchair-accessible van because her daughter was in a terrible accident and was a quadriplegic, institutionalized, and the only sort of real joy she still had in life was driving down the coast road in California, where you can actually, you know, smell the ocean and such. And the nice young 18-year-old man, um, boy, who, by the way, were picked to be clean-shaven, well-dressed, and exceptionally polite. That was their key training. In other words, they were the grandson they all wished their <laughs> yeah, I, was, I was about to say the perfect grandson. Yeah. The, all of this stuff is very carefully planned and scripted. They literally use scripts. Then they have entrepreneurs innovate, find even better ways to rip people off. And then they revise the script in a sort of a quasi-evolutionary struggle. Okay, so... She, she tells the nice old young man about this, and he says, well, then you should put all of your retirement in the bonds of the holding company. So you lead with a witness like that. It's all over. Because for the first time, there was a human face on the victims. 
and the human face was your grandmother. And again, this super Catholic uh, who uh, was famously gave a million dollars of our money, not his, to Sister Teresa, even ripped off a convent through the sale of these worthless bonds. So these are people who are depraved, right? Um, in psychology terms, it's a dark triad. They combine psychopathy, Machiavellianism, and extreme narcissism. So that changed things enormously, right? Those con hearings, because who watches C-SPAN disproportionately? Older Americans. Who was targeted? Older Americans. When you say a hundred billion of public money went to bail this out, um, how what would that be in today's dollars? Two twenty five. It's a hundred. It was one hundred and fifty. There hasn't been that much. Actually, it'd be at least three hundred. But it's big. But let me give you the you know a uh, precedence on what's going to come. The loss of GDP out of the great financial crisis, the best estimate is $41.7 trillion with a T, the American kind of trillion, which is a thousand billion, not the Brits uh, type of thing, right? It's staggeringly different scale uh, of these things. So it was terrible. It was widely considered the worst financial scandal in U.S. history, but it didn't even cause a mild recession, most economists uh, think. So we started this segment with you saying, uh, out of these convictions, some things were put in place. And the reason we get this crash, the, the big fraud in 07, 08, is these things were removed. So what are these things that were put in place that were removed? Okay, so just to... to fill in one loop before I get there, uh, I noted that the key thing was changing the politics. It wasn't just the prosecutions. It was our civil suits, which were not against the bank. They were against the executives. Huge change from the great financial crisis. And our enforcement actions, which were overwhelmingly against the individuals again. Once we did that, we again followed the same policy of putting it in plain English, because we were drafting those, not the Justice Department, and explaining them in plain English and the importance. And that meant com the combination of all these things is you got a story when we there was an indictment, you got a story when the trial began, you got a story when key evidence occurred, you got a, and this was regional and local and national news often, uh, and you got a story when the conviction, and you got a story when they went to, to prison. Drumbeat type stuff, right? And as a result, the politicians, as soon as we filed the civil action, before any proof, began rushing to return political contributions. The advantage we had turned jujitsu-like into a liability. And we knew we had won when one particularly sleazy member of the House, totally cynical, be, began wearing a, a pin, literally six inches in diameter, that said, jail the SNL crooks. Huh. Who was that? Um, he was, I'm blanking, Illinois. Uh, he was swept up in the postal scandal and had to resign in disgrace. Uh, and what and what happened? Point. What happened to Keating? So we eventually were able to get a conviction of Keating uh, as well. We also did a removal and prohibition actions uh, and brought some, uh, huge civil suits against him, but also against all the major entities that uh, contributed to his effort, like the uh, audit outside auditors uh, and such. So did Keating happened? go to jail? Keating went to jail. Keating's, For how long? Keating... I think three years, three and a half years type of thing. I don't, but, you know, this is a footnote, but as a criminologist, I don't want people to rot in prison. In fact, 
I want relatively shorter sentences. Uh, I'm not just talking about white collar types, right? I think over incarceration is uh, a major problem. Um, here's the key thing, among the key things. To my knowledge, not a single person that we successfully prosecuted in the savings loan debacle appeared in any future thing like the great financial crisis. And I, I've asked prosecutors who are more familiar with the Enron era, and they believe the same thing, that nobody that they prosecuted in the Enron era showed up again. But now we get to the great financial crisis. So first, what people need to know is a great financial crisis is really the third act of the savings loan debacle. In 1990, where all good financial frauds begin, Orange County, California, our examiners identify a novel. Think of this. They've never seen this before, and they get it right right away. They say, this doesn't make sense unless they're engaged in fraud in essentially the same way we've seen in the savings and loan debacle, but they're using a new ammunition, fraud ammunition. The fraud ammunition in the second phase of the debacle was commercial real estate. And commercial real estate is like, you might think of it as wholesale as opposed to retail. Home loans are more like retail, right? Much, much smaller. Commercial real estate are often $100 million a pop. It's actually easier to run the scams in commercial real estate. But this new system in Orange County was using home loans. And what it was, the key thing it was doing, they weren't called this yet in the industry. They wouldn't be called this for something like five or six years, was what we now call liar's loans, where the, you don't verify the borrower's income, okay? And the, there was a new element, and that was predation, targeting Blacks and Latinx folks. Now, big commercial loans, $100 million a pop, they ain't making those <laughs> to people of color all that much, right? So it had lots and lots of problems, but racial and ethnic predation wasn't on the list of that problem. But this new scheme did, and therefore it overwhelmingly used, and this is an incredibly critical thing that almost nobody, nobody talks about, loan brokers. Loan bro using loan brokers, there are two Nobel Prize winners in economics, George Akerlof and Paul Romer, who wrote one of the most important economic studies ever, looting the economic underworld of bankruptcy for profit in 1993, using as their primary example exactly what we've been talking about, right? These frauds. They worked with us and said, you folks are right. The economists, other economists are wrong about this honest gambling stuff. And they even adopted the same language as the sure thing uh, and such. Akerlof gets the Nobel Prize in 2001. Romer gets it in 2018. So this is not exactly chopped liver, right? In that article, which they published in 1993, they said explicitly, loan brokers are terrible. And everybody knows for years that they're terrible. They have perverse incentives to do terrible things. What do they give you if you're running the kind of fraud schemes I've been talking about? This accounting control fraud or looting. They give you plausible deniability. The really dirty tricks things the loan broker does instead of your employees. And you go, they promised me they wouldn't do things like that. But this is how it worked. You created enormous incentives. And the loan broker's key first fraud, first deceit, and the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission, the inevitable commission to look at the causes of the great financial crisis, quotes 
And indeed, you can hear they've got the full tape recording of the interview. The key guy who trained people. And he said, our fundamental deceit, which we organize everything to get you to deceive you about, is that we work for you, the borrower. Our interests are directly antagonistic to you. We screw you. That's how we make money, right? That is the business plan of a loan broker. Screw customer, paragraph one. Paragraph two, repeat endlessly, right? So just understand they are giving mortgages to people no. who they know. No. A loan broker can't give a mortgage. They're a middleman. Okay. They're, they're brokering a mortgage for a mortgage company, a bank. For a bank. For a some bank. Kind. And, and they know the person will never be able to keep up with the payments. So whatever equity the person has, they're going to lose it. Yes, but equity is not the issue. That's one of the, again, the, the leading myths that people focus on equity. So a very poor person might have $2,000 in equity. Sure, they'll be happy to steal the 2000 but that's not where the money is. The money is, what is a, we haven't discussed the second part of fraud in the loan underwriting process. And, you know, I didn't do it in the first segment uh, either, but what uh, the critical fraud was to massively inflate the appraisal. So how do you massively inflate appraisals? They do it in a really elegant fashion to use the concept of elegance in mathematics that old people like me were taught, right? I tell you what the number needs to be. I tell you what the purchase price is. You, I tell you, hey, there's a rush on this. Give me a oral estimate of value. You give me the oral estimate. Let's say that the um, sales price was $200,000 and the oral estimate is 190. I tell you, ah, don't bother to complete your work. Probably I stiff you on your fee too. In fact, we have surveys that indicate that was the norm about 68% of the time in those circumstances. But what I sure as hell do is blackball you going forward. So you blackball the least, the, the most ethical people so that you can select the least ethical appraisers who are willing to be extorted. So it's an outright extortion racket, which by the way is a federal felony, right? Just like when the loan broker fills in a false income number, that's a federal felony. So it's, it's incredibly bizarre since we have really good evidence on how incredibly common this became in the great financial crisis to do both of those things, to extort appraisers, to inflate appraisals, and to uh, massively inflate the borrower's income, that economists still go, fraud? What fraud? <laughs> you know, type of thing. The first question the task force set out to answer was how so many houses all over the city were selling at prices much higher than they were really worth. The appraisal was not only, you know, just a little beneath or a little above, it was thousands, tens of thousands above. Then the government appraisers would go out with us and they would appraise some and say, you know, there's there's just no way. This this is total this is total falsification here. The first appraiser to actually come clean, we had been looking for payoffs and we could not find any payoffs in it. And he explained to us that it was actually repeat business. He worked with others. Uh, in a systematic way to, um, uh, to commit a series of crimes, just like the mob. I, I think there's no question that, if, uh, that when it comes to the, the grander and, and, and bigger national conspiracies to uh, sell people loans that they shouldn't uh, have been sold, uh, and then to uh, package those loans into securities, that it, it could have been proven uh, by uh, hard work and, uh, uh, and, an investi and a commitment to, to, to see the investigation through. To, to take this on the same way uh, that we did in, the, in, in Akron. Uh, unfortunately, all the federal investigations that I'm aware of stopped at the level of the, of the mortgage broker. 
or maybe they, they threw in an appraiser who provided a false appraisal of the property, but they never used the opportunity to move up the chain to get to the folks that were actually uh, the masterminds of this, of this conspiracy. Frankly, what should have happened in 2010 is some CEOs should have gone off to jail. And RICO is a statement. They're, it's basically saying this is a criminal enterprise and we're going after this for what it really is. It's a criminal enterprise. It isn't a lone actor. It isn't one or two bad apples in the barrel. This is a, this is a you know, this is a whole barrel of bad apples. Co-conspirators working together to inflict damage on our society. So I think I think Rico makes a very very dramatic statement. I mean, you have to have a visible deterrent for bad behavior. There has to be some price to pay for for criminal behavior. Otherwise, we're in, we're in total chaos. And it's not just, you know, you can't just apply that to violent crimes and, you know, that type of crime genre. You've got to apply it. The most sophisticated criminals in the world are white collar criminals. And they're deterrable, in my view, because they don't like to go to jail. You take a violent career criminal and they, they live in jail. They thrive in jail, some of them. White collar criminals don't want to go to jail. So deterrents do have its effect in the world of financial crimes and, and white collar crime. This is the early 90s. Now the the broker's making his fee and the higher the appraisal and the more the loan, the bigger his fee. What's in it for the banks at this stage? Uh, the bankers, it's never, the question is never in it what it's in for the bank because this is looting. What's in it for the bank? That's the, remember the title? looting the economic underworld of bankruptcy for profit. So what's in it for the bank? Bankruptcy eventually, many years later. What's in it for the banker? That's the profit part of that uh, title. So always ask the right question uh, in uh, that regard. But we haven't yet even mentioned the largest source of income to the borrow, to the loan broker. The loan broker gets two fees potentially. One fee is a percentage of the deal. So as you say, if I can induce people to buy a home at over, way overpriced levels, way in excess of market value, I get more money as part of my standard cut, right? But the second one goes much more to this predation, the really nastiest aspects. So the loan broker every day, sometimes multiple times a day, gets what's called a term sheet from the banks that he works for. And the term sheet said, these are the terms on which we're willing to make the loans, right? Now there's a lot of wink, wink, nod, nod, but let's just stay with that, those forms. And you are forbidden to show the term sheets to the borrower by contract. Your contract is a loan broker. Right, So this is definitely designed to make the world opaque to maximize predation. And by the way, the same scam exists in uh, car financing. So you should never get your car financing from the auto place that sells you. So the form says, we're willing if they have the following characteristics to make the loan at 9%, right? However, if you can induce them to overpay and they pay, agree to pay 10% interest rate, then we will pay you a kickback. And the, of course, the bigger you inflate, are successful in inflating, the bigger your kickback. So your interests are completely contrary to that of the borrower as the loan broker. And how often were they able to induce people to overpay? Almost exactly 50% of the time where we have data, which, in the, which is to say, you know, they all typically won. And that this thing that I've just described, the kickback is statistically bigger. In fact, it's materially bigger than your regular fee even waiting it for it only succeeding half the time it is. 
This is where the real money was, was screwing your customer. At this stage of this, um, don't people have to be making payments for that, them to make their money? Or does the broker get a front-loaded chunk of dough for signing the person? Let me now explain accrual accounting to you. <laughs> Okay, so under generally accepted accounting principles and international financial reporting system, uh, firms use what's called accrual accounting. You know this. This is your credit card, right? Um, that they count it as an asset as soon as you use your credit card, even though you haven't paid them because you've undertaken an obligation. And so um, what you may be talking, I, I think what you were getting at um, are the exploding rate arms uh, that will develop years after this. So we're starting in 1990. Um, now we're going to go forward to about 2004-ish um, when exploding rate arms start. And this, and by the way, they discovered originally that consumers hated them and didn't want them. And so they engineered an entire campaign to figure out how to sell this. So the idea of blaming this on the homeowners is also bullshit, right? Okay, exploding rate arms is you start out with a rate and sometimes you start out with an even super, super teaser rate that might be as low as 1%. And then you qualify the borrower on the basis of that absurdly low rate. So at that really low rate, of course, your monthly payments wouldn't have to be as big, right? And so you would have sufficient income to repay it at 1%. But it's not going to be 1%. It's going to be 1% literally for one month of a 30-year mortgage. And then there's a second rate, and that rate might be 3%. And the 3% you pay for, then it gets complex, but let's say two to three years and ignore the complexity. And then at year three-ish to five-ish, the rate will explode and it'll be 6%, right? Which is roughly you're gonna double the monthly payment. This dramatic increase in mortgage fraud cases was the canary in the mine. It was the warning. This was money chasing people. This was not somebody looking for a loan. It was all designed to maximize profits for all of the different players. The person who sold you a loan made more money if they sold you a higher rate loan. They were sold a lot. They're selling to their very clients these loans that they know are a disaster. I lost my home, not because of money, because of fraud. I don't believe Addie Polk took out the mortgage on her home. I don't believe she signed any documents. They just generated all this junk, took home huge bonuses, and then when it collapsed, they said, oh, not us. This notion that the financial crisis was there wasn't fraud and there wasn't crime is absolutely wrong. It's dead. All right, let me see if I'm understanding. So the broker and the banker who's on the bank side of this, they're getting fees based on a promise of payment that they all know is bullshit, that it will never actually get paid because they never qualified the, the loaner of having the money to pay this. But their fees are based on a projection that's fantasy. You, you were fine until they'll never be able to, because it's, it's a little more complicated than that, of course, but you'll like it. Just stick with me. Okay. The point is that when even when you're playing 1% in cash, instead of what will be the fully amortized rate of 6% in the hypothetical I just gave, you get to, for accounting purposes, treat it as 6% because they're on the hook for the 6%. And so you get to recognize currently as income the difference. Even when you're paying the 1%, 
you get to count it as 6%. Jesus. Baseball been very, very good to me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and, listen. And in the trade, this is referred to as phantom interest. And so places like Countrywide, near the end, roughly a third of all their income was phantom interest. Now, the reason I intervened about will they ever pay it back is you're missing one central dynamic. If this fraud scheme simply collapsed within months, it wouldn't be anywhere near as lucrative. And so they make it far more lucrative. Now, one of the ways that the reason they come in with the exploding rate arms is part of the process of delaying defaults because you only have to get you know much less cash up front. So your default will occur later. But the second and far bigger one is the strategy of just paying an incredible amount of money to loan brokers. And that's the key thing you, people need to understand. Wall Street is brilliant about one thing. It's not cheap when it comes to bribing people, right? They are quite willing to kick off significant amount of money. So again, the testimony of this guy who trade the loan brokers for much of the nation is that the quintessential prior job to being a loan broker was flipping burgers, <laughs> right? They wanted people who know nothing about finance that had never had a professional job and professional mentoring about what it means to be someone who serves a customer. Because that would all just get in the way, right? What they wanted was your income in the United States, flipping burgers full time, would have been somewhere around 17500 you know, if you got some overtime type stuff. The average loan broker got $150,000 the first year if they survived, Okay. So, and in a single deal with a what we call a jumbo, a really large mortgage, like in California, um, $600,000, $800,000 mortgage, you could, through the kickback and the regular fee, get more money than you had made than the entire year before flipping burgers. Just one of those deals. They must be trying to identify sociopaths. <laughs> That's you, exactly be- what they're identifying. That what they do, and this is in the books, they hire 30 and you come back a month later and one's left. They put them in to a dog eat dog contest. And then they keep doing it until they have staffs. And as I say, then they develop scripts and then they find better ways and they improve the script or they create um, more sophisticated scripts about this is how we approach women of this age. This is a, how we approach black uh, males of this age group uh, type of thing. This is what works best. And the loan brokerage, as as you know, the United States is notorious for not having branch banks in the poor neighborhoods. So loan brokers Sometimes they had no office other than their home, but usually they're in storefront places in poor places. They're of the neighborhood. And again, this guy um, that um, trained folks explains that his motto, that he trained people that blacks should screw blacks and Latinx should screw Latinx. Uh, and, you know, you have to be a capitalist first. That That's a quote from him. It's not some screed, you know, by, by a Marxist publication. And this is a guy who loves the, the quote in front free market, uh, explaining all of this. And I, I think I just let me add that when this broke in Baltimore, uh, Wells Fargo was involved. Uh, they got hold of some of the internal emails 
of Wells Fargo, and they were out and out racist. The way you're talking about, just ov- overtly targeting black people, and 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 then talking about the people in, in the most racist, derogatory terms, and in fact, wouldn't even try to sell uh, some of these uh, liar loans, as you say, to white people. They were explicitly told, "Don't sell to white people. It's just for black people." Yeah. So, I mean, this was just hardcore stuff. And to skip forward, um, as you've mentioned, uh, I've been very active in the con. Well, the con tells the story of the great financial crisis for the first time, right? Uh, It's the first documentary treatment uh, that actually tells the truth about these things and with a real emphasis on this form of predation, but also Uh, the liar's loans and the fraud and the looting uh, nature of it. So um, almost every documentary presentation about the great financial crisis is just absolute nonsense. Uh, You know, it has nothing to do with what actually uh, happened in many cases. Some of them are fun, um, but uh, they don't really relate to the substance. Okay, Bill, so we're going to end this segment. Uh, We're going to show a clip from the film, The Con. I introduced this in part one. Uh, Bill was an advisor and is in this uh, film, The Con, and they've very generously uh, given us some clips we can show. So I'm going to end this segment with a clip from The Con, and then we'll do a a part three with Bill and continue the story. So thanks for now, Bill. And thank you for joining me on the analysis.news. And we're going to end with a clip from The Con. Addie Polk was specifically targeted for who she was because she was living in a poor area. She didn't have any direct, you know, any direct descendants. She was widowed and she was a minority. You can go in mostly poor minority neighborhoods and you would have people canvassing the neighborhood, knocking on doors, putting flyers in your mailbox. Say, we can help you. We can get that roof fixed. We can get you new windows. And sometimes they would have information on your house that you didn't give them. They would just look up your house. That was commonplace. The weak, the meek, and the ignorant are our best targets. That's the words they put on paper to describe those folks. So that has meant that the quintessential victim, you know, if you wanted a single face, that face would be of an elderly black woman. That's the quintessential victim of predation in the financial sphere. Keep in mind, when you had all of these little mortgage companies, these people had to find their victims because they had to keep things going into the pipeline. They had to keep up a certain number. It started in the inner city, but like anything else, when it was getting good and the money was, Then it branched out and everybody became fair game. And this is why we have to stop seeing each other by color. Because if it starts over there, it's gonna come over here sooner or later. And so as a result, it's now a national problem because everybody knows somebody who lost their home. The system said that poor and minorities are disposable. The system says that that was simply the cost of doing business. The mortgage company said after Addie shot herself, well, we'll forgive the loan. You should have never made the loan. You should have never made the loan. We'll forgive the loan, but she shot herself already. People can say all lives matter. I say black lives matter, not because white lives don't matter, but because traditionally when something like this occurs, no one comes to help. Black lives matter, Eddie Polk matters. If anyone else who has lost their home, who have lost their life, They matter. I hope, I pray that we can come to some sort of common ground that people need protection from those who are seeking to make profit. People need protection.